Hi all, and welcome back to the Hive series on PCB design with KiCad. Uh, my name is Ben, and in the series we've been walking through the PCB design process using KiCad as our electronics design software. Excuse me. So part five, A, B, and C, has been focused on the layout portion of the design in the last video, 5B. We placed all of the components onto our board and routed them all into a single cohesive layout. Um, in this part 5C, we're gonna finish up the design process by confirming the board visually and via the DRC and then plotting our Gerber files for fabrication and assembly. Let's get started. My final layout looked like this. Yours may look different and that's totally okay. As long as everything is connected and there are no more air wires, those like thin white wires, uh, you can totally continue. If you do still have air wires in your design, pause the video here and finish routing first. All right, so before actually running our DRC check, we want to make sure that uh, the physical placement of everything, things are the right size, I can press all the buttons, the footprints are right, how big is this board actually? It's hard to tell from the design, from this you know, digital view. So there are two separate ways uh, that are synergetic, synergetic that uh, we can do this with, the 2D printed view and the 3D view. The 2D printed copy will give you a one-to-one -one view of the size and whether the footprints are right, literally by placing each part on the actual printed sheet of paper. The 3D view is more holistic and makes sure that like the buttons can be pressed and also gives you kind of a sense for what it should look like in the end. Maybe that's useful, maybe it won't be. Printing a 2D copy is easy. Just go to your file print, standard print menu. Um, obviously it's not a standard print window, however. Usually the default layers on the on the uh, left are fine, although you can definitely get rid of the adhesive or paste or silk screen layers if you want to. Uh, most of this is about how big the pads are and the pad and the part outlines. Um, definitely leave the drill marks as real drill, uh, or the size will be completely wrong and you'll be confused. And make sure that the scale is one to one. Always recommend doing a print preview first. Um, looks something like this. Uh, again, I, the copper layers are not selected because the routing isn't relevant. We're not really looking at um, like where that the placement of that is. We're really looking at the physical size and shape of the boards and the parts. Um, physical part component, physically placed components onto the board to confirm the footprints after you've printed. Um, this can be very helpful to avoid using the wrong footprint or like a super tiny package or something silly like that. The 3D viewer is readily accessible through the view menu or Alt F, sorry, Alt 3. Looks something like this. It's pretty cool. Just automatically generated. Um, you can, you know, move it around. Left click, to, left click and drag to orbit, scroll wheel to, and drag to pan, scroll wheel to zoom. <clears throat> Um, we're missing a couple of 3D models though, particularly the diode and the uh, battery holder. So how do we add those? Um, I'm going to show you how to do it with the battery holder itself. So if we go back to the layout view and open the properties window of the footprint in question, uh, that's right click the battery holder in this case and go to properties. Um, you can open the 3D models tab at the top that's all the way to the right. Then you're going to locate an acceptable file. That's a step or an IGES file. Um, generally it doesn't take like SolidWorks files or um, other 3D files generally take some other ones some other ones but not that many um, you're going to adjust the position as necessary to fit flush on the board now note a well-designed 3D CAD model here will have the origin aligned properly so that it only takes one or two rotations to have the part sitting flush um, Poorly designed files, you'll know because you'll need to like do some very fine adjustment to get everything sitting nicely. Now, does it matter that well if it sits nicely? That depends on what you're doing with the 3D file. It's possible you'll save the 3D file and export it and then import it into a mechanical so software like AutoCAD or SolidWorks and then do some work with that. And in that case, maybe the height really does matter. But if you're just looking at it, maybe it doesn't make that much of a difference. Anyway, once you've adjusted the position, uh, you can go ahead and click OK, and then when you open up your 3D part, 3D viewer again, those 3D parts will show up. I'm really not sure why this is green. I couldn't deselect it. I don't really understand what was going on there, but again, that is OK. 
Cool. So now that we've actually uh, looked at all the elements and we've printed out a copy onto our piece of paper and made sure all the footprints are right and done any redesign related to that and made sure the button is in the right place, yada, yada, all this stuff, we can actually now run the DRC to make sure that the layout is actually in um, is actually acceptable to our fabrication house, assuming that we've gone in and set those DRC rules in the board settings at the beginning. If you haven't done that, now is your opportunity to do it and hopefully it won't be too, there won't be too much changes that need to be done later. So let's go ahead, you can click this icon here, highlighted by the arrow, or you can go into inspect and design rules checker to open the, the DRC window. It's pretty boring right now, so let's just hit run DRC. Ah oh, man, so we got eight violations here. So what's happened? Let's click on the violations to highlight the markers and kind of locate them, which will give us some information about what we're looking at here. So we clicked on an error. If we click on an error, um, it'll highlight the marker in this light pink color. Um, other errors are going to be in the kind of red arrows. And then different from the schematic, warnings are actually highlighted in orange or this yellowy color. Um, if you right click on the error in the DRC window, uh, it'll bring up a context menu, which you can either choose to ignore or exclude the error. Um, or you can run something called the clearance resolution tool. KiCad's documentation says to do this, but I frankly haven't, didn't, wasn't able to use it effectively and I didn't really understand what it was good for. So, but it is there if you want it. Either way, let's look a little bit more carefully at what our errors actually are. The first four errors you can see are of clearance violations um, with things on the power net class, meaning uh, the clearance minimum was broken. That's what clearance violation means. It violates the clearance rule. That means that something on a net within that net class is too close to something not in that net class. Taking a look more carefully, we can see the issue by using the measure tool, that's control shift M or the highlight icon highlighted on uh, the lower right there. By hitting control to ignore the grid, you can see that the space between this ground pad, which is on the power net class, and the net D1A pad, which is not on the power net class, is only about 12 mils, or 11.81, when the rules we set up previously in the board setup required a minimum of 16 mils. What to do about that? Well, actually, frankly, nothing. Uh, we're gonna safely ignore this error. Why? Um, well, the clearance number that we set was arbitrary and completely above what the minimum was set to, which was eight mils, so I'm really not worried about this. Um, <laughs> excuse me. If it was an issue, we'd have to go into the footprint editor and adjust the spacings manually but that would be a huge pain. So not today, Satan, not today. Clicking through those four errors show us, shows us that they're all the same and they actually are related to the ground and the V in pins. Um, so they're identical errors. So we're just going to right click and exclude them, each one individually. I don't wanna hit ignore all because, or adjust their severity because I might miss something important later. Ignoring um, will ignore the type of error. I don't wanna do that. So we're just gonna exclude them and make sure that they're kind of basically checked off. We've dealt with them, we know they exist, we don't care about them. Looking at the warnings, the first warning says that the footprint doesn't match uh, what's in our library which totally makes sense. We did edit it. Remember those pin, those pads, we renamed them. So um, we're gonna exclude those as well. Right click, exclude. Uh, the second warning says that the silk screen was clipped by the mask. We zoom in and click on the left click the, the warning. It'll zoom into where we, uh, it'll move to where, we, where the problem is. Um, and you can see that this one overlaps with the pad. So what's happening here is that um, solder mask is actually, after the, the copper is all kind of, um, it, all the traces are placed, uh, solder mask is applied over the entire, um, the entire board, then silk screen is patterned, and then the solder mask is actually removed. So what's going to happen here is if you, uh, that one, the one, the part that's over the pad is actually going to be removed when it removes the solder mask. Do you care about that? Probably. Um, so you can actually left click and drag that L1 out of the way to move it somewhere a little bit more, a little bit safer if you want to. I'm not getting this board fabricated, so I don't really care. So I'm just gonna exclude this error as well. And finally, the last two errors are silk screen overlap. And if you click on them, they're the two pairs of LEDs having, well, overlap with their silk screen. Um, again, you can actually left click these symbol or these uh, names and or these reference designators and drag them away to make them uh, not do this anymore. 
Um, but again, I don't care because I'm not fabricating this. If you are fabricating this, you should do it. It'll make your life better later. Um, but I'm just going to exclude both of these. And that resolves all of our DRC issues. Ta-da! Which means, congratulations, the design is done and we have a fully checked and ready board. The last thing to do before we send it off to fabrication is going to be to plot the Gerber files. So what are Gerber files? They are special text files that define the polygons on each layer of your design. Um, you typically need to send these to a fab house for fabrication, although some take KiCad project or board files directly these days. Make sure to read your fab house's instructions for plotting these carefully. They definitely have a KiCad specific page about or section about specifically how to set this up. Um, but it's because it's very easy to get something wrong and get a bad board or a non-fabricable board back, or uh, they'll complain to you about it. So to open the Gerber Plotter editor or Gerber Plotter, um, either with this icon that I highlight on the right or through the File Plot option on the left, this is what the plotting window looks like. Uh, you can set an output directory for where to save the Gerber files to. It also takes relative directories based on your project, the primary pro the primary project directory as well. Um, as I mentioned, read through your fab house's instructions carefully and they'll be, have details about exactly what to set in the general options and all of the rest of it, settings. Um, and whenever you're ready with all that, you can hit plot. Um, hopefully you won't see any errors listed here, which is good. And once you're done plotting and you fixed all your errors, you can go to generate drill files at the bottom right. Because the drill files are technically not generally technically a separate thing from Gerber's. They're not technically Gerber files or drill files, whatever. Um, either way, the output directory uh, will be the same. Um, and then Exelon is usually okay. Although again, read your fab house's instructions for details about what exactly they want. Um, and then once you're done with that, you can hit generate drill file at the bottom. If you're having um, automated assembly as well, you might need a map file. Um, if you need that, uh, generate map file is also on the bottom right. Uh, and that would be, again, defined by your fab house. Those Gerbers, uh, it can be viewed through the Gerber viewer, uh, through the project, um, project manager window here. Um, you can open them using the icons on the left or just file open. Um, Drills are open separately, again, because drills are not technically Gerber files. They're a slightly different format. Um, files are automatically detected, usually, and show up on the right. Um, and you can import a whole bunch of them and then deselect them as you'd like to kind of show certain aspects of it. Um, it is always, always, always a good idea to double check your Gerbers, each one of them, before sending them to fab. Better you catch errors now than catch them in a week when you get your board back. That is always unfortunate. So try to get them all now. You probably aren't going to catch them all. That's normal for a first design. Just note them as you see them and then adjust them for the second revision. Whoo! And congratulations, you made it through the design process. You have a fully designed board that is basically ready to be sent for fabrication, except for a couple of those little silkscreen errors that you can fix on your own time. At this point, you could stop the video, um, but the next few slides, I'll provide you with some additional resources and information for you to keep in your back pocket or use as a bookmark if people still use those. So some next steps, if you're actually interested in making this PCB, um, you can fabricate this board here at the hive yourself. Um, you might need to adjust the traces. You'd need to put the traces and the surface matting components on the back side of the board probably in order to actually attach the, like get the solder um, to actually attach the traces with the through hole components. Remember that uh, in part one at the end, I talked about that important fabrication note. This is where that comes into play. Anyway, um, if you would, or you can send that Gerber's off to have someone do it for you. Totally cool. Um, you can email the Hive's PCB group with that email address for the bill of materials, and we can try to see if the Hive can purchase these components because they're really inexpensive. Um, for future revisions, you might consider reselecting some of the parts for SMD only design. So like the LEDs and the battery holders um, and the switch could be SMD only. And then you've got a single sided board, which is nice. Um, you could also put the LEDs on a separate board that plugs in for a more like forward pointing flashlight. Something to think about. Some KiCad resources, documentation, library conventions, forums, more resources, official DRC templates. These are really valuable for 
Um, if you want to uh, get the, the DRC, the rule settings correct, you can import a template uh, for your fab house and that will set all of the design parameters supposedly if correctly. And there's also a plugin and content manager uh, right from the project managers window. Some of them are made by fab houses for official integrations, uh, but there are plenty of useful um, add-ons here that can be helpful for your various design needs. And you can also obviously always make some. Um, further resources for design. Design guidelines from David by David Jones are like great. They are a classic, some history of design, the numbers are a bit outdated. There's a couple other things that are a bit antiquated, but for the most part, the concepts are spot on. They're great. Um, it's a really great read as well. Good PDF. A um, couple other ones here. Phil's Lab is always a good resource for some for design tutorials. Um, really nice. Uh, and I also have the standard, the Hive standard resistor sizes here for you if you uh, remember and need them ever. Um, for fab, here's a bunch of lists of a list of some part sourcing options. This is not all of the complete list by any means, as well as some fabrication houses here. Uh, the hive obviously does not endorse any of these suppliers or fabrication houses specifically. They all have pluses and minuses. It's totally your call about what you use. Um, most of those fab houses, however, have I've either used I've used most of those, if not all of them before, and all of them have given me excellent results. Um, but your mileage may vary as always. And finally, some miscellaneous resources. Uh, Google is your number one resource for almost anything here. Uh, seriously, you should get really proficient with this and uh, learn and use keywords specifically to find the things that you need. Really, really valuable. Um, there are hundreds probably of guides on design, KiCad and other EDA software available on YouTube, Adafruit, Sparkfront, and many, many more. Um, hunt around. Um, and of course, if you're on campus, you can always feel free to stop by the Hive to ask questions. Um, you can always email us. Um, I, we try to answer emails in a timely manner. We're always here to help with your design and fab. Um, we are typically open during the semester, the middle of the semester from like 11 to six roughly. So, And with that, we're done with the design and done with part 5C. Congratulations. Uh, a PDF of this video will be available as well, linked in the description as always and hosted on the Hives Wiki. Um, there are four more videos left, uh, six and then 7A, 7B, and 7C. And these cover library management and model creation. It's not design specific and it's a little bit less exciting, but if you are thinking about doing more design, it's really valuable to understand how to keep your parts organized and ordered for later use and reuse, as well as how to create your own models in the event that you really need to, which does happen occasionally. Um, part six is going to be specifically with symbol libraries and symbols, and that duplicates some material from part four. Um, Part seven, which is split into those three videos, A, B, and C, will cover footprint libraries, custom footprint generation as well. Hope to see you there.